Um, and I'll slip back and forth, I promise, over the next couple of minutes, calling it aldosterone or aldosterone. I've been in an endocrine division when I was in Texas, and I've also been in general medicine divisions and in nephrology division. So I have, I have too many Bs living in my head to pronounce these words correctly. It's like finance and finance. You know, there's, you sort of define yourself at a party by your accent. So the way you say the word aldosterone or aldosterone tells someone else where you're coming from in terms of your quote credibility in this area. Aldosterone, aldosterone has been around for a long time. It was originally called electrocortin when it was given a name, and there was a point in time when it was simply a letter. And we used to, it, we, I talk like I was around here, in the 40s and 50s, when they were first teasing out all these hormones from the adrenal gland, they had a compound they called S and a compound they called F. F is cortisol. You may be taking cortisol, for example, if your allergies get an inhaled form of it. And so all these different letters. And then, you know, they realized that some of them had more glucose effects, some of them had more mineral effects. And the mineral effects are what we now call mineralocorticoids. And aldosterone is one of the premier mineralocorticoids. It's made in about one to one hundredth or one to one thousandth the amount in the body compared to cortisol. Body loves cortisol. It's the body's answer, makes it in all sorts of situations. But cortisol is just as effective as aldosterone at stimulating what aldosterone does. So the tissues where aldosterone is really important, like the kidney, the colon, the salivary glands, and one or two other places in the body, they have an elaborate enzyme system that metabolizes cortisol to something that's inactive so it can't bind to the receptor. That means that those target tissues, the kidney especially, can selectively now respond to aldosterone separate from any stimuli that manage the cortisol side of things. And the most important reason that aldosterone is around is because we tend to be, at least we have in some of the history of our human past, people who don't always get adequate amounts of sodium in their diet, if you can believe that in this day and age. If you are walking across you know, the Gobi Desert, or if you have a GI illness and you're losing fluid from both ends, you're losing sodium and water and potassium and water from the vomiting and the diarrhea, you now have a threat to the body circulating volume. And here's where aldosterone comes in, like the veritable cavalry on the white horse and leading the charge to keep you alive. So aldosterone or aldosterone is a lot like your appendix. You know, you really don't need it in our culture because we have free access to salt and our GI illnesses are usually short term. But when you find aldosterone active, when your right lower quadrant hurts when it shouldn't because your appendix has done something funky, then you've got a problem because aldosterone helps to save salt. And it does that and it doesn't care what the blood pressure response is. So it can save salt when you don't need it. And that's our problem. Aldosterone by itself is not so bad but when you take out osterone and throw salt in on top of it, now you've got the fixings for a perfect storm. And that perfect storm is all the consequences we see when we look at hypertensive patients who have either low or suppressed amounts of aldosterone versus those that have normal or higher levels of aldosterone. And when you look at any consequence, the blood pressure, whether it's stroke, heart failure, kidney disease, progression, development of atrial fibrillation, one of the current darlings in cardiology, those are all more likely in a hypertensive person matched on every other thing if they have more aldosterone around because of the role of sodium in expanding the volume and making the left atrium stretch too much, fibrillation, making the left atrium and heart get too big, heart failure, keeping you know, the blood pressure high, stroke, and giving the kidney a problem trying to get rid of salt by pushing it harder. So aldosterone has been around for more than 75 years that we've known about, but it's really still kind of a, a Rodney danger field in the hypertension field because it doesn't, it still does not get the respect that I think it deserves. And so we've been trying to educate our or whatever, our brethren in healthcare, whether it's nurse practitioners, PAs, docs, GPs, internists, whatever. But I think aldosterone is one of those um, <sighs> sharks where all you see is the dorsal fin sometime and you don't know what's on the other end of it, but there is clearly uh, problems still unaddressed with aldosterone. Final point about it is that when you look at that population, I was saying non-adherent, 
on four drugs, for example, and their blood pressure is still high, at least one out of five of those people with drug-resistant hypertension have clearly abnormal amounts of, and this is abnormal amounts, not just high levels of normal amounts of aldosterone around. So that's part of what we why we've been successful in managing drug-resistant hypertension in our little shop in West Philadelphia, because we are aware of that and many physicians aren't. So when we see patients, one of the first things we do is to measure the aldosterone concentration and its partner hormone, renin, in order to assay whether we've got a problem there or perhaps need to look elsewhere. Over. The presentation I gave at ACC was sort of like, you know, it was like revisiting your medical student days. So it really was sort of the endocrine portion of your biochemistry training. I went back over the basics of what it is that governs aldosterone's production and release. You know, the, the, when I was first engaged in what's called intermediary metabolism research in the 80s, we thought the fat cell, for example, was just this blob of triglyceride in the body, and all it did was manage your, 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 your energy stores. Now we know that there are over 600 things that come out of your white adipose tissue cells, one of which is leptin, and leptin is a very strong stimulator of aldosterone production. And part of the reason I went through all this background stuff on aldosterone on, on Sunday at the ACC meeting is that as we see more and more people who are getting larger and larger with metabolic syndrome and even diabetes, that's a population where we know there's a dose response effect on leptin stimulating aldosterone and the blood pressures are sometimes very challenging to manage in these overweight people. With Govi and Ozempic aside, and maybe things will get better in 10 years, I don't know. There's still problems with the weight loss issues associated with those drugs. But the talk I gave was really to review what I hope people knew about why there's still a blood pressure problem in the US, why it's sometimes related to aldosterone excess, and what's the underlying physiology behind that. That's what I talked about. There's an old saying um, from the uh, management um, uh, literature and it's this, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. It's by a guy named Drucker, who was sort of the godfather of finance. And when it comes to aldosterone, it's fairly easy to manage because you can measure it. We can either measure it in the blood or in the urine. And when Jennifer Brown published her recent review in the Annals of Internal Medicine, looking at aldosterone in a variety of populations, she was surprised, I think, because she kind of read between the lines, but you know, it is still the case that a lot of people don't measure it, despite what we know about it. So my goal has been preaching the gospel that aldosterone is important and you can measure it. So get out that electronic prescription pad and do the diligence. Mm -hmm.